Good evening, everyone. My name is John Tate, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that McNally Robinson is located here in Treaty One territory. That's the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Creek, Dakota, and Dene peoples, in the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Roostertown. We are so pleased that you could join us both here physically in the space and also virtually for the launch of Six Ostriches, the latest Dr. Bannerman event mystery from Dr. Philip Schott. I won't take up too much of your time uh, because I know we're all chopping up a bit to get to the actual event itself. I just have a few thrilling housekeeping notes before we get started and then I'll introduce tonight's participants. We're always uh, so pleased to have Philip behind the microphone here in the atrium. And uh, the one thing I will point out just before we start is one of the uh, slight consequences of having events in a giant glass box is that you will become uh, very familiar with the sun as it slowly creeps its way across you. Rest assured that they'll be tormenting one of your neighbors momentarily and then will disappear entirely before the end of the event. So thank you for your patience of that. Uh, so there will be a conversation that will take place over here. There'll also be a reading from Philip from the book. And following that, there'll be an opportunity for you folks to ask questions, if any occur to you. If you do have a question during the Q&A period, please just put up your hand and I'll run over to you with this microphone, which I assure you is not a comment on your ability to project your voice. It just ensures that those watching can actually hear your question. And if you are one of those folks watching, please feel free to just write your question into the uh, chat on the YouTube stream, and we will put them to Philip as time permits. There'll be some absolutely scintillating details about signing procedure at the end of the night, uh, so stand by for that. The only thing I will put in your brain right now is we'll just ask you to remain in place for one dramatic moment while we bring Philip over to the signing table, uh, and then I will have more instructions for you and you'll be able to descend. So we are so thrilled to be launching the second book in this wonderful series. Uh, it's a mystery series from the author of many beloved books about his veterinary exploits already, and it starts, as so many stories do, with an ostrich swallowing an inappropriate item, which then leads to a thorough investigation from the titular Dr. Bannerman, and of course, his sniffer dog, Pippin. You'll hear a little bit more about that in just a moment, but I'll first introduce your author. Philip Schott was born in Germany and grew up in Saskatoon. He now lives in Winnipeg, where he practices veterinary medicine, writes, and shares a creaky old house on the river with his wife, two teenagers, three cats, and a dog. His first book, The Accidental Veterinarian, was a bestseller and was translated into five languages. And every one of his books has made the bestseller list here at the store. Your host, Doug Spears, has a humor or had a humor column in the Dunk House, which appears in the pages of the Winnipeg Free Press at least three times a week old, <laughs> starting in 2006. Uh, no one is exactly sure why. In his irreverent columns, Doug put this in his bio. In his irreverent columns, Doug tried to focus on the vital issues of the day, but generally ended up writing about himself and his family, especially his two dogs, because he isn't overly fond of getting out of bed or leaving the house. He was a finalist of the 2008 National Newspaper Awards for column writing, and in 2017, the Project of the Year category for the class of 2017. I should have won that. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was a travesty, wherein he chronicled a single class of students from kindergarten to grade 12 graduation. He and his wife, she who must not be named, have two children, neither of whom think he is the least bit funny. Doug retired at the end of October, though he continues to write a weekly column for Saturday's paper, and is now focused on the most important part of his phase of his life, being a grandfather. Please join me in welcoming Doug Spears and, of course, Philip Schott. Oh, stop. <laughs> here we are again, Philip. Here we are here. At, uh, was it December we were here? To, I got to help you launch. Uh, yeah, last year. Uh, November, December. In there. The battle cry of the Siamese kid, although for some reason in my head, I always want to say the battle cry of the samurai kid. <laughs> that works. Which, but it actually did, considering that particular cat. Um, so, oh, I just want to point out, you know, it, it's nice timing that on the, on the evening of your book launch that you get we covered in the free press a section front great big photo of you and a story about your new book so i'm guessing you know someone at the paper to <laughs> i do now <laughs> actually i did I, I, I asked them if they could do something and, and 
one, there's, if you haven't read it, it's in today's uh, Arts and Life section. The front is a wonderful article by Ben Sigurdsson, all about uh, Philip and his new book. And uh, just as we get going, it said, for the last, I'm a very slow reader, uh, but a very thorough one. So I've spent like the last every word. Right? Two, I've been reading every single word of, of, uh, of uh, Six Ostriches, and I've got like a chapter and a half to go. So the second this is done, I'm going home and going to bed and reading the last part. And uh, I, I will keep you in suspense. I, it's, it's, it's wonderful, really. Is. You've got to, trust me, buy a copy, buy two copies, get them signed. It's it's wonderful to have a guy like this living in Winnipeg and writing these wonderful mysteries that reference like, you know, his main character goes to McNally Robertson and buys tea at Cornelia Bean and does all the stuff that we do, you know. There are some differences, but we'll get into those. So, uh, Philip, explain, how do you go from being beloved veterinarian who's, who's writing books of, you know, heart-touching, heartwarming, moving humorous stories about kittens and dogs and fish and, and other things uh, to uh, creating a, a fictional small town and then killing most of the people. <laughs> in the town. How does that come about? Yeah, I have some dark secrets, I guess. <laughs> no, the, um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to write fiction and I wanted to, as well as nonfiction, and I wanted to explore a location and explore characters over a series of books. And I thought, you know, I don't do horror. I don't, not that I, I don't think I can write science fiction. Sort of horror. <laughs> I don't want to tell you what happens. But. I'm interested in fantasy, but I don't think I can write it. So what remained was mystery as a genre. And um, I don't recall for 54 Pigs whether this question was asked or not, because that's the first novel. The very first thing that came to my mind regarding that was years before I thought of writing any mystery novels, I suddenly had a mental image of a swine barn exploding. I've never seen a swine barn explode, not personally, maybe read some news articles, but I just had this image and I thought, and I had an image of a veterinarian watching that happen from a distance. I thought that would be- A heroic veterinarian. Well, not entirely heroic, he's <laughs> standing at a distance. Um, After <laughs> letting go. Like the dynamite. <laughs> I thought well, that would be an excellent way to hide a body in a exploded spine bar. Yeah. And so that just sat in the back of my mind for 10 years, 15 years, and then eventually became the germ of what became 54 Pigs. So you know your wife is sitting right there. <laughs> so does it worry you at all? Or is your husband up here talking about this would be a good way to hide a body? <laughs> Waste I'm sure there are, there are many others, so she'll kill me before I kill her. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, this is something that I mean, you were always wanting to be, even when you were out before you, before you became a veterinarian. I mean, yeah, writing was like something passionate. Yeah, yeah, you. right from like high school. I always I was one of those freaky kids that actually really liked the essay question. Um, really look forward to writing essays. But yeah, I had a very practically oriented father who said, oh, that's all good. I'm glad you like that stuff, but get a profession. And then you can, <laughs> and then you can do that on the side. Yeah, so that's how that Also, don't be a comedian. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah, so that was that. Well, you, you mentioned your dad. We should, uh, one of the first things I noticed in reading the new book, like the, when I read the first book, it, it kind of popped into my mind. I thought, Peter Bannerman, Heroic veterinarian, the sleuth, clearly to me seemed to be on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, yeah. but it never, it's not spelled out. And in the second book, it is, you, you just, yeah. decided to spell out the yes that he's that he's on the spectrum somewhere. Yeah. So I'm curious, kind of, why, why yeah. did you not do the first book and then? Yeah. The so it was both for deliberate decisions. So in the first book was deliberate decision not to apply the label. I thought, I want to neurodivergent character who's just integrated into his community and society without the labels floating around. Um, just, you know, as people are just tall people and short people and dark skinned people, and light skinned people, as people of different shapes and people of different shapes of brains. And that should just be considered normal. There should be no abnormal in there. But <laughs> in the reviews, a number of readers didn't of the first book of the first book, yeah, fifty four pigs, where I didn't specify that he's on the autism spectrum. Had a number of readers um, and reviewers say, "Yeah, this is great, enjoyed it," but I didn't really like the main character. He was just 
you know, really weird and kind of kind of cold and so on and so on. Yeah, but there's a reason for this, right? It's, um, so in this, in Six Ostriches, I slipped a message in there, I mentioned in there, and, um, and the response to that has been extremely favorable. So uh, among the neurodivergent community that has read the book, oh, yeah, no, so sure, the, yeah. um, and just the general readers, suddenly they, they get it, like it just makes more sense to them. Than it. Representation matters, Philip. Representation matters, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he's similarly on the spectrum, right? It is a spectrum after all. But you so, do, I mean, some of the best moments of the book are kind of when, um, you know, and he'll be drinking a cup of tea because he's always drinking a cup of tea in this book. So right. maybe for before we get a, do you love tea that much? Or <laughs> Me personally, no, no, no. I like tea well enough, and I like different kinds of teas. I don't remember whether in this one or the previous one, there's mention of lapsang sushi. Oh yeah, no, there's lots of lapsang sushi. <laughs> it's, it's a dark tea and it's better for winter. Yeah, yeah, so and yeah, and, yeah. and uh, when should you have, you know, Earl Grey with the bergamot? So I've learned more about tea, about how to kill someone, you know, in a gruesome manner, and then how to relax with a nice cup of tea. Yeah. And the, ne the next book has a fair bit about Roy Bosk, which okay. is not really tea, it's actually, so we go into that. African. So, <laughs> so and now because we start talking, what was I going to? Well, we were talking about being on the spectrum, right. uh, and that is uh, uh, that's something that you have some experience with. I mean, not you know, could you describe that to stuff? You yeah. you know a fair bit through your family. Yeah, yeah. So my my father is definitely undiagnosed autistic, and that comes out in the will around the book that's based on his life story. Um, but yeah, other family members, you know, children, siblings, etc. You were more open talking to the free press, you know. I mean, <laughs> what worried someone were watching? <laughs> they don't read the free press outside of Winnipeg. <laughs> of course, they should know. I think they all have the look of subscribers. So. Yeah, I know. Both my kids and my brother are there um, also. But it yeah. feels like that's important. Like so many, you know, detective novels, but the main character has to have to be interesting. Yeah, and I wanted to be interesting in a different way. So the. Um, the one thing I wanted to break was the cliche of the detective as the burnt out middle-aged man. Like most of them are that they're divorced in almost every case yes. or we know sometimes. I didn't want that. So we've got a solid marriage in this book. And most of them are alcoholics. I didn't want that. It's interesting, but it's but on a different kind of hence the tea, I suppose. There's a little bit of whiskey in there that comes into this. I book. yes, I also <laughs> noticed that. So I actually noticed yeah. that more than the tea. And most of the house is a lot of the whiskey. Oh, I'm, he's really stressed. So that's when the good whiskey, that's when the Highland Park comes in. <laughs> he's not drinking Canadian club or stuff. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and he doesn't have a bunch of skeletons in his closet. I think it's a pretty open book um, once you realize where he is. Well, very open. I mean, like, and, you know, but okay, so I, I, I'm reading it. I really wondered. You know, because he he talked he talks slashes thinks about himself and about his childhood and stuff like that. Very open about you know what kind of that he was geeky and played Dungeons and Dragons and, and was awkward and, and uh, not that any, you know, if you play Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> good on you. Um, but uh, where was I going with this? That he's you know obviously on the spectrum. Um, you know, he, you've created a, an interesting character, who, but his his uh, being on the spectrum. Neurodivergent that seems to account for both his attraction to mysteries, to, yeah. to puzzles that he's drawn to, and he can't help himself. I mean, you yeah. do sort of describe that he can't, you know, to the point where he feels he's got to lie to his wife, and I'm sure that's just fictional. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and also, it's the way his analytical way his mind works, yeah, that it helps him solve this. So, with, without it, he, yeah, no, he's very much got a math brain, he really. Yeah sees everything as potentially having not just potentially as having a logical background you just have to find it you have to get enough data and then you can figure this out it's always just a question of do you have enough data so part of you that you are in there you are part of you is peter yeah so i when i asked i described peter as an extreme version of myself so i take some of my traits if you will my foibles and weaknesses and amplify those i imagine myself as my father, for example, or people that I know that are on the spectrum, and I push myself out on there. Maybe I'm a little bit as well. I don't know. Um, but I push myself out on there. I think, what would I be like if I some of these things were amplified in me? And Peter's maybe a little bit taller. 
He's quite a bit taller. Yeah. He's like, and that was just a random choice. Like, what is he? He's like six three or something. Yeah, six. It's, it's six actually we'll find out in the first uh, paragraph. I can't recall what I wrote. I think six five even. But we'll find out in a moment. And I'm trying to phrase it here. Like I don't want to reveal some of the things that happen. You know, some of the stuff right. I'd love to talk to you about is stuff that was sort of like, oh, well, I guess I won't read it now because I know that this, you know, <laughs> this dramatic thing happens. But there, uh, you know, and there is some like you know. I don't know what's going on in your brain, but there, there are, are some, uh, you know, these aren't just casual the way people die. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, yeah, we got hit by a bus. No, no, there. Yeah, like, so it's, it's funny. Like, oh, okay, that's gruesome. I mean, it, it, is, it is kind of funny because the, the books have been shelved as being cozy mysteries, but a lot of reviewers say, well, it's kind of cozy adjacent or it's cozy if it's cozy plus. Really gruesome things. <laughs> yeah, which, but, but they always happen kind of off stage in a way. Like you see the outcome of it, but it's not yes, yeah. vivid in front of you. Um, I don't know. I did. I when I wrote it, I had no idea there was such a thing as a cozy mystery. I didn't. I actually, confession: I don't really read mysteries myself. <laughs> so we're gonna shut this down. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know all the different subcategories. Or say it's the publisher that that's it. Do you really not read mystery. a lot of mysteries? Like, I have in the past as a few. I, I so way back in the eighties, I like Tony Hillerman, who wrote um, Joe Leekhorn, yeah, Echo, yeah. Restoration Mysteries, and I'm a big fan of Alexander McCall Smith and his uh, Botswana Mysteries. Um, well, you you're trying to write as much as him, like Alexander McCall Smith, probably by lunchtime. Has <laughs> written more than I wrote the first six years of my career at the Free Press. So, uh, and you're, I mean, okay. Uh, we've got the three accidental veterinarian books, yeah. uh, which which are wonderful and, and you know true tidbits of your life. You know some serious things, some funny things, some touching things, um, and then you've got the book about your dad, mm -hmm. um, nonfiction, and then you now you've got the two mysteries, right? And there's. I'm thrilled because I was going to press you. Like I hope there's more to come because now I'm, I'm hooked now. I want to, I want to know more about these characters, both Peter and Laura and, and uh, Kevin, and Kevin, and you know and Kevin's boyfriend. And, oh, there's. <laughs> um, so, but there's not just there's not just one more ready to go. There's two more ready to yeah, go. So right? one, and and the the is, is, yeah, one Huskies. Yeah, Huskies is written. There's a teaser chapter at the end, but it's written. The process of like manuscript till shows up on the shelf here is about 18 months. It does take a little while. Right, so right. that's we're about halfway through, it'll be out in the spring. Um, they're just going through edits and so forth. Um, shout out to ECW, thank you for editing my books. <laughs> An editor is a really valuable, valuable thing to have a good editor. Yes. Um, and then in that, there's a teaser chapter for Three Kittens. I've written the first chapter for that and about the concept. It takes place actually in Winnipeg. I want to spread things out from New South Wales, as it says in the article in the Free Press with these small town murder mysteries. At some point, it becomes a population crisis. Right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to. Why are you not killing people in New South Wales anymore? Anyway? <laughs> because they're all down. <laughs> So Eleven Huskies takes place in northern Manitoba on a fictional flying fishing oh, lake. Oh, cool. And, um, That's a good idea. And then Three Kittens will be in, in, in Winnipeg. And then, uh, and then I've got sort of the, the, the roughest concept for the next one after that. But, uh, yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> I've decided I'm going to start feeding you ideas. Like, you'll get red calls. Like, Peter, what about, say, a giant rat from Sumatra King? You know, <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be pretty awesome, yeah. Uh, but you've created this this community. I mean, I initially did not know. I, mean, I don't know if you guys know every friggin' Manitoba community. Because I mean, they're like East Braintree, West Braintree. You know, <laughs> I mean, there are every time you think you know them, then a new one comes up. So I wasn't positive that New Selfos was fictional yeah. or real. I mean, I yeah. thought it could be real, but it's not. You created it's not this, real. fully created, yeah. But it seems it seems real. I, I guess yeah, that's yeah. That, was, that, was, that was the point. That was the point. You know, I with I had Gimli in my mind, but I didn't really want people nitpicking about oh, you got that wrong about where that is, or this guy is definitely so and so from real life. I didn't want any of that, but I like the idea, the Icelandic Canadian community and like the lakeside brought together some elements of what makes Manitoba special. And yes. part of my 
objective, if there's an objective other than just having fun writing, is trying to make Manitoba cool, cooler. And, to, and I get this, you know, I get writers or readers from all sorts of places writing in saying, oh, well, Manitoba sounds really interesting. Well, it is. So <laughs> it is. Well, because you, yeah, yeah. you know, and of course, you've got some, you know, like the people on the west side of the lake don't like the people on the east side of the lake. And they're like, it's like gang warfare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was the, the fishing war in 1922 Gimli. between Gimli and yourself. Also. But it's such a fictional, you know, we might think, uh, Gimli, you know, but the way you describe it, like in, in, uh, uh, in 54 pigs. I got the right number of pigs, didn't I? You did, yes. Uh, like the lake becomes, a, you know, the frozen lake in winter becomes a character mm -hmm. in the book. And it's like very exotic. It's like a lunar landscape. Like yeah. You yeah. go out there and you can't see anything and you're probably going to die. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, yeah, Peter, oh, yeah, let's take the boat. We'll go out in the lake have a nice casual walk. Yeah. yeah, people find people in places like Alabama thought that was pretty cool. So, <laughs> what kind of reactions have you had from like? Far places. Yeah, yeah, positive. Uh, yeah, positive with I mean, the books generally, but specifically how Manitoba is described and the seasons and so forth. Yeah, no, very, very positive. And that's kind of a hidden agenda of uh, 54 pigs are set in the winter. This is set in the spring. 11 huskies is in the summer. Three kittens will be in the fall. The next one will be in the winter again. We'll you, my way through them. You have some stuff that you like to do right like oh, yeah. they, you know there's going to be a number in every title there's a lot of compartments is that <laughs> like one well, okay what 54 pigs six ostriches three kittens and like how many partridges <laughs> so yeah. they're that's just the thing that the yeah the numbers are kind of random 54 pigs was 54 because i was 54 years old when i wrote it and you're now 57 i'm 57 yeah you're just a kid <laughs> and six ostriches was because they're named after Sesame Street characters, and that was the number Which I could think of. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful <laughs> that's a, <laughs> So on it goes, and the 11 huskies, that's about right for a slight team plus. Have you ever examined an ostrich? Uh, from a distance. Um, so in vet school, we had an ostrich as a patient when I was in fourth year. So we rotated through, and there was you know, a group of us, 20 or 30, looking at this ostrich plus the clinician. And this ostrich had come in epileptic. So you have to imagine these things that have these giant, <laughs> giant claws, right? These, these claws like railway spikes, if it starts to flail around. I mean, you're, there's already a significant risk of disembowelment if an ostrich gets angry. So your you. colleagues are going, Philip, I think this is your case. <laughs> <laughs> you can take this one. So we learned the, the, the cool trick that if you have to get medication to an ostrich, back up a little bit, we're told don't wear our lab coats. Why? White buttons. Ostriches like to peck at white things, but they white round things. Oh, for whatever reason, maybe maggots in Africa, I'm not sure why. But the, um, so you put the medication in a marshmallow and the ostrich just. That's not, you didn't put that in the, the marshmallow song book. No, Marshall's on. Okay. You're going to have to <laughs> throw a reference <laughs> into one of the others because the other characters are going to keep up, except for the ones that are dead. That right, right. There. I'm they're not writing a zombie book. They'll be <laughs> you know. And the other, another thing, we're, we're looking at a lot of the obscure stuff in the books. Like, do you really like playing darts? Are you a good darts player? No, no terrible. Okay, because like that's the thing. <laughs> All you out there that have had me do surgery on your patients, on your pets, please close your ears for what I'm going to say next. I have terrible hand-eye coordination. <laughs> that would explain some of the stitches. <laughs> yeah, I've got a really poor depth perception. So, yeah. Anyway, so it starts with, no, it's, that was just kind of like pulling some there. stuff out there in the pub. Yeah. yeah. They're probably going to play dirt. I did want to have, I love English pubs. I'm in England fairly frequently, and that's just one of my favorite things in life. So if there had to be one in Manitoba, <laughs> in rural Manitoba, as impossible as it might be. But. And now Peter, when he's not like solving a murder or drinking tea or whiskey, he's going to be playing darts with the pointsman. The pointsman, yeah. 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 New South Wales pointsman. There's a whole league of in the league. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, the, uh, for the golden... Uh, the golden only they were players, of course. Yeah. Yeah. For the golden dartboard, yeah. And Selkirk steel tips. You see, I can talk show now. I don't remember the book. So, um, yeah. you know, I am like I've gone like when we launched the first book. I'd only read that one, like one yeah. of the, the nonfiction ones. And now that I've read the fiction, you know, now I'm being a real fanboy. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> for me, you know? You're a dog. <laughs> what do you want to talk? What, what else do you want me to ask you? 
Uh, how about um, Nordic extremism? Okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to reveal too many plot points, but that's yeah, so they're very interesting. That was the know. genesis of this particular book. I was casting around for um, an idea for the next one. You saw a story or something in the paper or something. Yeah, I read about, um, I don't know where I read it or where I encountered this piece of information, but um, about neo-paganism or it's also called heathenry, the, the revival of um, the Odin. ancient Norse Odinism, yeah, the ancient Norse religions. And um, I was thinking about this, and at the same time, different part of my brain was thinking about ostriches um, for some as in reasons. As in was. <laughs> so that's the so that had the intersection point there that gave me the, the start, like the, the ostrich swallowing this object. And then I went down the, as one does, the Wikipedia rabbit hole about heathenry. And it turns out, so a satra is a recognized religion in Iceland now. And this is what we call um, universalist yes. type of, so these are, gentle hippie type of Nordic, well, not, I shouldn't say hippie type, but ones that are, will uh, allow the non Norse to become, join this religion. Yeah. It's all about nature and peace and so forth. But there's a splinter group, not so much in Iceland, more in um, Norway and um, in Denmark, that call Odinists, also called focusts, where it's real white nationalists, this is the pure religion yes. of the Northern yeah. race and so forth. So, so that plays a role in this book. And the notion that maybe they were here long before we thought they were yeah here. yeah so we yeah we, we get into get into that uh, it's still I, mean, I don't know yet exactly how that plays into killings and you know, you know. You'll find out. so I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. that's always the toughest part you know finding out all all the what all the loose threads were that's where the editors are really helpful like in the deal long like in the last chapter tying it all up and bringing, bringing those loose threads together and making sure I haven't dropped any. So right now you're still, what is it, two days a week you're vetting? Three. Three days. Yeah, two and a half. Okay. To, and but that's precisely half time. That's going to come to an end. It's not yeah, right. slowly, slowly. So end of this year, I'm going to switch over just doing ultrasound. I've been doing ultrasound um, for a long time, and it's a better ultrasound, obviously. Did you do <laughs> ultrasound on a snow leopard? I did do ultrasound on Snow Leopard. Yes, that's fun too. <laughs> Razor sharp. Yeah. So um, there's still, I enjoy it. Not that I don't enjoy the other aspects, but I enjoy that. And um, it has, there's a lot of flexibility built into that. So I'll do that just sort of on a more casual basis, but no longer be doing the frontline stuff. And unfortunately, courtesy of Gray Hair, I'll still be doing management. Um, so. But you're going to devote more time to writing. Yeah. Yeah. So. It'd be like what a book a week. <laughs> you're, you're turning out, like you've got like six books out, and you've been doing it just like part time so. for three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, four years to be fair. Um, yeah, so um, part of it is I want to write writing this fiction series, but I do want to write some more nonfiction and um, and history type of stuff that require a lot more research. I'm working on a history of um, veterinary medicine right now, which is. Uh, aimed at the general public, mm -hmm. like an accessible, kind of a fun, lighter history. But and I realized, wow, well, my pace is much slower now because I have to do so much research. I can't just sit there and type. Well, I think people enjoy, like I certainly do, that in the book, you know, you're investigating, there's the murder, and then, and then suddenly, oh, there's a client with, and you deal with some vet stuff thrown in, yeah. kind of like when you're watching Chicago fire and they're, you know, it's all about the romance between a couple of firefighters and then suddenly the alarm goes and they're off and there's some truck is yeah. over. The and readers seem to like that. They want, yeah, they want more of that. that. Although I don't, it's hard to do that and not have it distract too much from the main story. I don't know. I don't struggle with that. I, I think that's great. <laughs> I mean, you do kind of, he is a vet after all. So, yeah, I mean, he's a vet. You know, and he begins, he, he's, passionate about animals? How would you describe his relationship with animals? Yeah, yeah, you know, he's, um, because he's on the spectrum, he has sometimes difficulty relating to humans and really understanding people's emotions and uh, the social feedback and so forth. And it's easier for him with animals, for sure. So he does have a very close relationship with his dog in particular. So you have one dog? Yes, one dog. And three cats. And three cats, yeah. And do you Take your dog out. Have you sent train your dogs? No, or? no. Well, you know, my dog is beautiful, but he's not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> that's, exactly. I mean, that's a big part of what plays into both the books so far is that yeah. Pippin is, is a champion sniffer dog. Yeah, he's, you know, he was sort of an afterthought at first when, uh, when the editor read the first draft. He said, Oh, you need to write more about the dog. People love the dog. 
Now I love it on too. Well, so it's, it's becoming for you. It's like I don't becoming see Peter, in the plot. Without like, Pippin, I don't think Peter's solving anything. No, no. <laughs> you know, like, Pippin's like, you know, remember when I pointed over here? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. That's Are we getting close? Where's John? Where's the question? Are we getting close to asking the uh, people in the audience? Or, or should uh, I do a read? Yes, a little more time. Yeah. Yeah. We can keep talking forever, but do you want to? We'll read a little bit. So, um, you know, with the mystery, it's hard because um, I don't want to give anything away. So no. I'll just start at the beginning. And actually, the, the first chapter is the most ostrich intensive chapter by far. And I do suspect there's people here, not because they like mysteries or they particularly like veterinarians, but they have a secret thing for ostriches. You can sort of tell when we sat down that they were ostrich, ostrich people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's Especially right. the guy in the back is putting his head under the chair. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an ostrich crowd for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right, so six ostriches. A Dr. Bannerman book mystery. So flip, flip, flip. I'll start with the prologue. Prologue. The fence was gone. Yesterday it was there, but this morning it was gone. He ran towards the opening. Maybe the man took it away. Maybe it disappeared. Much was unfamiliar in this country, so everything was possible. The others stood back. They were cowards. He was the leader for a reason. There was no danger. He knew this. This was an opportunity. That's what it was. Let the cowards miss out. He crossed into new territory and looked about him. The grass was much longer here, and it whirred and clicked and buzzed with many different kinds of insects. Tasty insects. Tasty plants. Paradise. Toward the shrubs, it was wetter, and there was even more in store, even more insects and tender looking shoots. He trotted to this spot and began to peck at everything, gorging like a child let loose in a world made of candy. Then something caught his eye. It glinted in a shallow pond. It was like a piece of the sun. He was so clever for coming here. The cowards would not get this delicious morsel. But it was not delicious. The piece of the sun was beautiful but it tasted of nothing as it went down his long throat. It should have been warm and soft, but it was cold and hard. It had unpleasant edges and corners. This was surprising. It was nothing like what he imagined eating a piece of the sun would be like. He began to consider the impossible, that he, the leader, had made a mistake. Chapter one, Dr. Peter Bannerman and the ostrich stared at each other. Even though Peter was Six foot five. Oh, okay. We're never the, the ostrich was still taller than him, so Peter had to tilt his head upwards to get a good look at the bird's eyes. Caution was warranted around ostriches, but there was a strong fence between them, so he was safe from kicks. A quick, sharp peck was not out of the question, though. Peter didn't get any closer than necessary. How long has he been off his food, Dan? At least a week, and he's hardly been passing any droppings. I think it started when I let them into the new pasture on the north side. Dan Fable, a powerfully built middle-aged Métis man with an iron gray brush cut and an impressive mustache, looked mournful as he said this. Dan had recently taken early retirement from the Royal Canadian Air Force to start his dream exotic livestock farm on the edge of New Selfless. I thought I was doing them a favor. The grass and the bugs were so good over there. Too good, do you think? Did he overdo it? Maybe, Peter said, as he continued to consider his patient from a safe distance. I'll be honest, Dan, this is my first ostrich patient, so I'm going to have to do some reading before I assume that I can just extrapolate from chickens and ducks. Do you hear that big bird? The doctor's going to do some studying, and he'll, then he'll fix you up. Dan's gentle, childlike sing-song was in comical contrast to his military bearing. Big bird, is that his actual name, Peter asked. Yes, Dan beamed. And that's Ernie, Bert, Mr. Hooper, Oscar, and the Count over there. He indicated to a corral on the far side of the house where five ostrich heads bobbed above the high wooden fence. They're all girls except Big Bird and Mr. Hooper. I figured ostriches don't care about gender identity. And my grandmother, my granddaughter loves their names. No, I don't think they care, Peter chuckled. Is there anything you can do today while you're here? Well, it doesn't hurt to take an x-ray of the proventriculus. The what? It's sort of his first stomach. Pro means before and ventriculus means stomach. It's the first place the food comes after traveling down the esophagus. And it's a common place for blockages to occur. 
at least in other bird species. The gizzard is the next stomach, and that's where all the grinding happens. Because birds don't have teeth, big chunks can go down and get stuck before they reach the gizzard. Dan rubbed his chin. Sounds like a design flaw. The gizzard should be first. Ha, huh, I suppose you could argue that. But the proventriculus secretes digestive juices that soften the food and make the gizzards work easier. Oh, okay. So you can x-ray here? For sure. I'll just run to the truck and grab my portable unit. In the meantime, can you round Big Bird up, put him, and get him in a position where I can approach his lower neck from both sides? Will do. I'll get Kim out to help us. Peter walked back to his truck, which was parked in the muddy yard between the paddock and the house. He enjoyed the momentary break to think. He also enjoyed the soft breeze and the novel sensation of warmth on his face in the late afternoon sun. It was mid-April, and the sun was finally something other than just a source of light. He wasn't a sun worshipper, far from it in fact, but as much as he loved the challenge and invigorating bite of a Manitoba winter, by April he was ready for a change. As he opened the compartment on the side of his new selfless veterinary service truck, where the extra unit was stored, he paused to listen to the trill of a red-winged blackbird among the cattails in the small pond beside the drive. This was the soundtrack of spring, and it's going to be a good spring, he thought. This was not just wishful thinking, it was logic logical because the winter had been so difficult due to everything that happened after the explosion of Tom Pearson's swine barn. The pr principle of regression to the mean dictated that it was likely that spring would be more average than winter had been, and therefore, by comparison, good. The x-ray machine was compact and came what looked like a large black cooler on wheels. He grabbed that and the flat gray x-ray cassette before walking back to where Dan and Kim were herding Big Bird into a squeeze chute by waving blankets at him. This was a funnel of fences, where the parallel ones in the spout could be adjusted to keep the animals snugly in place. Platforms on either side allowed access from above. Okay, I've got the hook ready, Kim shouted. She was considerably smaller than either Peter or Dan, but she had been an Olympic gymnast as a team, and from having seen her work with her ponies, Peter knew that she was still exceptionally strong and quick. She was wielding a long pole with a blunt-ended hook at the end. While Dan stood behind Big Bird to prevent her from backing up, Kim snagged the ostrich's neck. She managed to look, make this look both forceful and gentle. And then in a split second, she put a hood over Big Bird's head and released the hook. This had the desired effect as the 250 pound bird immediately became calmer, no longer flapping his stubby wings against the sides of the chute or flailing his head about. Peter was impressed. It was like something out of Marlon Perkins in the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Kim and Jim's role. Good job, Kim, he called as he approached. Now please get him to shuffle forward so he's tight in the squeeze. This took a little more doing as Dan and Kim maneuvered Big Bird back and forth until they had the squeeze chute settings exactly right to keep them in place. The chute was made of steel tubing, and fortunately the gaps were perfectly spaced to allow access to the area Peter wanted to x-ray. Peter was proud of his new x-ray equipment. It was digital, so he could review the results instantly without having to develop films. This was not only more efficient, but saved stress on the animals. In a matter of seconds, the black and white images appeared on the monitor. It's good, you can let him go, he called from his crouched position beside the machine. Okay. This was followed by banging and flapping noises as the chute was opened and Big Bird ran off, presumably in a foul temper. What does it show, Kim asked as she bent down beside Peter and squinted. Dan joined her a second later. See this? Peter pointed to a whitish blob at the bottom of what was obviously, even to a layperson's eyes, the neck. Yes. That's the proventriculus. All the white stuff is food, mostly leaves and grass, I'm guessing. It's jammed full. The whiteness shows the density, so it's quite impacted. Silly, greedy bugger, Dan said. But what's this? Kim asked, pointing at a bright white T-shaped object. Good eye. I was just about to get to that. Peter tapped on the screen to zoom in on the object. The crossbar of the T was shaped like a squashed pentagon with the point opposite the stem. It's metal and about the size of your thumb. Wow, Kim said. Peter tapped some more, zooming further and then adjusting the contrast. Now look, you can see there's some sort of symmetrical etching or design on it. There's no way to make out exactly what with an x-ray, but this obviously isn't a natural object. Crazy, I guess you'll need surgery, eh? Dan said this quietly. He looked over to where Big Bird was now standing, preening, presumably to get the human taint off of his feathers. Peter thought he noticed Dan's eyes moisten. Yeah, I'm afraid so, but it's not a difficult one. Previous owner of this property had young kids. They must have lost some sort of toy, Kim said. She and Dan walked Peter back to his truck. We'll find out soon, Peter replied as he swiped through the calendar on his phone. 
Day after tomorrow, good. That's Wednesday. First thing in the morning. Perfect. See you then. And that's where we'll stop. This is a really, I really love these things. This is called a dinkus. Oh, it's a little mark. Yeah. Then they, they use it to break up parts of the chapter and the little ostrich. It. And then it, was, it was pigs. It was pigs. And I had a reader actually count them and discovered there were 54. And that was complete coincidence. Absolutely. That was just really? Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, it's a strange world, right? It's kind of creepy. It is creepy. It's creepy that the guy counted them <laughs> to begin with, and then somehow they're, uh, yeah, I would not let him in your house. <laughs> yeah, I think on Terry or somewhere. So, are you getting to know Peter a lot better? This is your second book, and you've got the third ones ready to go. I mean, are we learning more about him because you know more about him? You're yeah. more comfortable with them? Yeah, for sure. You know? And more comfortable, are you more comfortable with the writing too? Do you feel that much more confident in, you know? I think so. You know, other than the mystery part is always tricky, right? Just getting, balancing the clues. It doesn't really, for both these books so far, I've had an even breakdown of readers saying, oh, the solution was too obvious versus those saying, that was much too complicated. You just kind of pulled that out of thin air. You didn't give us any clues. All right. <laughs> so so that, that part's tricky, but writing the characters and settings and all that is easier and easier. The characters kind of write themselves. It's this mysterious mm -hmm. process where they it just They're kind of happens. Them. I don't have to think about it. It just happens. So any of us could do it. So any of us could do it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the dirty writer <laughs> secret. <laughs> Give us the name of your publisher. That would, yeah. that would help. So. Yeah. No, he's a wonderfully quirky kind of guy, but you know, yeah, and you know, I, I like it. He, so it just makes him interesting. So, oh, I, I think, John, is, is that your dramatic gesture that we should go to audience questions? Oh, only when you were finished your own question. That is. Uh, you know, I have no idea where I was going with that, but uh, you know, a, a, a point, of, a quick point I'll make. What I, what I like about it is, is I mean, I love you know the, the killings and the more accomplished <laughs> the better. But uh, as my buddy Bob sitting in the back of the room once told me what people like is that when it's like getting into a warm bath you know the characters and you know what to expect and you know you go oh i've got a i've got the new philip shot 27 gazelle book <laughs> and i'm gonna read this and you just feel comforted that you're gonna spend the next so many hours with uh, with people that you're interested in that you've come to like so yeah, that's what I'm hoping to do. It's when I, from the writing perspective, it's enjoyable. To I'd say you've more. already done it. So quit being so uh, <laughs> so humble. So that seems like a good note. That uh, by the way, if you don't ask a question, you're not allowed to leave the store. So that's just, I don't think they they told you that coming in. So I know some of you have some some great questions. Nobody else has read the book yet, right? Because it's just sort of. Have you read it? And. Just gonna nod that yeah, furry <laughs> that you've read it, that you enjoyed it. And, you know, no, go away. <laughs> well, that was a good interlude. So, all right, let's have a question. Something dramatic, something insightful that uh, will really put them, you know, really challenge them. Was Sarah? Sarah I'll take. You know? I'll take lame questions as well. I'm okay, so I, can, I can make Bob ask. A Bob, ask a question. Think of something that you. You know, this is not not so much about the subjects of the book, but about, I have to tell you, I uh, typically, uh, I hate to admit this as a former newspaper editor, but the, uh, the I uh, typically like to listen to books now because because I, I, on Audible, I find that I could get so much book reading done by listening to us while driving in my car and various other things. And, uh, the, so who do you like to read your books? I, I, I can't remember who read your yeah. the last book, or the, the, the 54 Pigs book I listened to. Uh, and I, I, haven't, I assume this one will soon be, soon be yeah, available, but same, yeah. same, same reader too. So the, yeah, the publisher is very good about involving me in the, um, in the uh, interview is the wrong word. Um, what do you call it? Um, audition. Um, audition. There, is, there you go. <laughs> um, the, in the audition process. So I get, um, I get to have my say in that to some extent. And it's like a fellow, um, an actor, uh, from Scantra named Miles Miley. Um, and he's, he's a re listeners have loved him so far. And I think he does, he does a really good job. Unfortunately, I throw a lot of weird words at him. Um, there's, this one's packed full of Icelandic and so forth. That he, says, oh, yeah, yeah. he does an admiral job um, with it. 
some of the books um, get um, contracted out, like Blackstone's picked up a couple and then they just do their own thing and I'm not involved with that. But, um, but the, this series, ECW is doing it in, uh, themselves. And then the audiobook thing has really exploded just in my brief career as a writer from you know, 2019, my first book to now 2023, when I get my, see my statements, the amount, the percentage that's taken up by audiobooks and ebooks has increased dramatically. Obviously, the pandemic had a big um, effect on that, but that, that those are huge drivers for sales now. Hmm. Although you make much less as an author, I'm saying. <laughs> you're ready to make a you're ready to make a pittance on books, and it's a it's a fraction of a pittance on an audiobook. It's harder to autograph <laughs> an audio recording ticket. It is, yeah. It's, it's, I'm not an expert. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay, somebody else has to ask a question. That was a good question from Bob, though. I thought, you know, he was not planted in the audience. Just happened to come by. I think. Oh, come on now. Don't just, you know what? I mean, I've done this for the RWB, too, and I don't let anybody go to see the show until they, like, at least we get five questions. They get quite angry about it, too. But, you know. Well, you're a terrible group. Look at this. <laughs> Okay, there. I'm sorry for calling it terrible. You're quite a little bit good looking. You're a good looking girl. So, where do you do most of your writing? Uh, upstairs in what we call the office. Um, so, yeah, we've got a spare bedroom upstairs, and that's where it all happens, just on a PC. Um, I don't know how writers did it in the typewriter days. <laughs> and again, I've got um, there's writers I know who still worship their typewriters, but if I didn't have the cut and paste options and the delete options and the internet right there for research, it would just be much slower. I wouldn't be writing at the pace I'm writing, I can tell you that. So do you drink coffee? Uh, yes, yeah, so writing's in the morning, um, and so a bit of coffee, yeah, and I switched to decaf pretty soon. So. I still think like he, every second thing Peter is doing is, is you know, like, oh God, Got to think about this gruesome killing. Best have some love thanks to John. <laughs> you know, if you had mentioned Cornelia, you, 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 clearly it's Cornelia B. You referenced yeah, it. Yeah. If you mentioned their name, you'd be like a wash and free as much tea as you could handle. <laughs> Next book for sure. <laughs> I, say, I can still edit a lemon husky, so I'm going to change that. I would <laughs> think just just the thought. So um, I'm very much looking forward to the next books. So I I'm not going to end hope now. I think it's wonderful that we have, you know, local a, a local guy doing, you know, mysteries that we can enjoy and be scared by, and you know, and having these people, you know, wandering around Winnipeg or Gimli or you know, it's you know, yeah. it it shows us that we're just as interesting, we're just as valuable. And I think that's part of what's kind yeah, of something that you wanted that's to show people. Exactly, not fly over country. The Americans call it flyover country, right? Everything between the east and the west coast. And well, we're Americans, we wouldn't have them in the house. We? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> um, so, as far as ebook and things like that, like, yeah. it, 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 are your books are they available on things like Spotify or anything? Like yeah, that? yeah. So Spotify, that's that's quite new. Um, they um, they do um, audiobooks now as well. So it's cropped up. It's cropped up there recently. I don't have to, I don't know what the business model is. So I haven't asked my um, publisher how that works exactly. But. Yeah, like how, how would you get a cut of the cut of that somehow? It's hard to do. <laughs> Won't be much, but uh, yeah, I think there's a couple. I think we're there, right, right beside the bookshelf. Do you anticipate uh, Batterman to become? Famous like Louise Petty's Gamache series, because yeah. that would be that would be the ultimate. <laughs> yeah, it's not something I can anticipate. I don't know. Um, I that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Um, but um, but yeah, who knows? Who knows where these things go? I, I was told from the publisher, um, from from specifically from my editor, that these things build over time. That you know, as they just slowly gain momentum, as long as I don't drop the ball. But yeah. Who knows? I mean, it's very specific. It's particular. It's a little quirky. It's it's. I think I'm writing something that's fairly niche. So I don't. I don't know. Um, it would, yeah. My wife and I were just talking about this earlier. Um, you know, it, it, a couple of film companies have sniffed around, and I don't. I haven't, but just sniffed really, and then. <laughs> 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 and 
into college. But I'm not really even sure I want something. Oh, like come that. on. No, no, no because if we're not buying <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm no J.K. Rowling, so I don't think I'm, I would be given enough creative control, and I'm not, I'm not a very controlling person. So I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so there. <laughs> so as is Peter. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I so so there is a lot of you and Peter. Yeah, and vice versa. Yeah, a lot of Peter and you. So yeah. I guess that would make sense if I wrote a book and yeah, be about some heroic retired newspaper. Well, that's what the editor said. So it is a fighting crime. Be prepared for them to then say, you know, we're going through pre-production and so on, and we decided a chiropractor works better than a veterinarian. So <laughs> no, and, uh, no, we want to not Manitoba. It's going to be Montana. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. A rancher chiropractor. That's right. the back record. <laughs> I love to say that. It makes them very angry. So you know. I actually, this question actually is about something to the book, uh, which is, I'm curious as to how you uh, chose your characters, because um, some of them are unusual. I mean, a gay RCMP officer, that's a little yeah. unusual for the, for the interlink kind of thing. So so how did you come up with the whole cast? Sort of thing? Yeah, it, my, I guess the driver was trying to shatter cliches in the genre, I get it. <laughs> being ignorant of the genre because I haven't read very much of it, just kind of heard about it. But I, yeah, like I said, yeah, I wanted Peter to be in a in a stable marriage and not have skeletons in his closet and not be, you know, alcoholic, etc. And um, and then you know, Laura, I wanted her to have like an interesting, unusual hobby that was ended up being sort of a profession for the knitting. And um, are you a knitter? I have double with yeah, okay, so that's what my wife likes to She's <laughs> hardcore knitter, so good choice there. And then you have Kevin, the RCMP officer. I knew I needed some kind of police connection to make this even remotely plausible. Um, and then I just, yeah, I wanted to just break stereotypes and cliches about um, about both um, you know, sexual orientation and the RCMP. And so there you go. <laughs> I haven't gotten any email about it yet, so. You will. That's, 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 that's no, 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 not on. You know, a, a few positive comments. Yeah, the, the people saying, oh, "Thanks for the atypical shout out." So good. Okay, that's what I, that was. That, I guess that's what I was after. Well, it's and, important. And then, yeah, you know, and I wanted to populate new cell phones, cell and secondary characters with quirky people. It's quirky town. I invented this. McLean's really. Does McLean still exist? This is a rude question to ask. Probably <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> So I invented this um, McLean's quirkiest town in Canada contest. Uh, they they, right, they right, need to run down. So New Selfless is the winner of the quirkiest town, town in Canada. So just to make it more fun. I mean, it really, this is meant to be entertainment, right? I don't think I'm going to change anybody's life by reading a book like this. But it, I mean, there are, I mean, so and you don't feel guilty about them being entertaining. No, or, you know, no. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, all writers, I think, I don't know, I can't speak for all writers. I aspire to literary fiction as well. I think everybody does, but we'll see if that's in me at some point. But. Well, just keep, I'm, you know, I'll need a steady diet of these. Like, I'm looking forward very much to the next one. I mean, which I mean, we should be able to get our hands on when? 11 Huskies, May of 2024. Okay, see, he yeah, actually, just a cover up today. He's got so many books coming out that now he has a oh, we can't we get a hold on to that one. He's, you know, like I can't put anything more on my Facebook now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People, I think people get tired of me quickly. So, so what about yeah. when people come, like you're right now, you're still doing seeing clients and stuff. People come in and yeah. do they talk about the books? They do, yeah, they do. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's, it's kind of cool, it's fun. Uh, Nobody's come in really mad like with the you know the accidental veterinarian ones that you've you know right. they, I recognize I was myself. Soon, I was super careful about changing names yeah. and uh, not just changing names, kind of rearranging some details and so on. And um, and there's stories I didn't include that would be just too personal or too hurtful. Or, yeah, trying to be stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> but th that was my introduction to your writing was was. Uh, those and I really enjoyed it. I mean, you know, I like stuff that makes you laugh and makes you cry. And uh, so you're, you must be, you're, you're an emotional guy. You I guess have so. a yeah, soft sure. you're like, yeah, you yeah, know, no, I cry at movies and stuff. Yeah, like that. Especially if something happens to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we see the worst thing about 54 pigs. The number one complaint from readers was that the pigs all die. 
It's like, oh, yeah, I guess they do. <laughs> that's the, the you know that drives the plot forward. Well, but as we know, man, about that. That. we're like the pork industry here, and <laughs> when there's a, when there's a barn fire, yeah, I mean, like you're tempted as a headline writer of the paper, right? You know, fire kills two hundred and fifty. You know, and no ostriches die. I don't no, think I'm yeah. giving anything away by saying no. But Peter, the very I think the last sentence of the book, if I recollect, is is him. I think he's going to sleep or something, and his last thought is those poor pigs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Which really kind of humanized him. But the pig lovers didn't really, that didn't buy me, buy me any credit with them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're not offending someone, you're not doing your job as a <laughs> so horror so. mystery writer. So We're actually at the top of the hour, so if uh, you folks have any closing comments, please feel free to offer them. Well, you should get the last word. I'll just say you should, everybody should go buy, if you haven't read it, buy a copy of this, get it signed. Who knows what it'll be worth and when he's, you know, takes over from, you know, some of the other big Canadian writers. And you're going to get there. Just keep doing it and, and have fun. Just keep it. I think you really enjoy it. Yeah, that's, that's spending why I time with that. I'm, I'm not a masochist, not in that way anyway. So. And that's why I think we like to spend time. We like to go to New South Wales and say, oh, what a quirky place. And look at the weird people that are there. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you know. I have some thoughts on interesting people who could be there, perhaps a retired newspaper columnist. Speaks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. highly of himself. Yeah. No pressure. So, anyway. Yeah. The, yeah, my last words are simply that thank you. Thank you to all of you here in the real world that came out on a beautiful evening where I'm sure you'd rather be sipping drinks in your on your deck. And those of you out there in YouTube land, I presume there's some of you out there. <laughs> thank you. This None of this is possible without people reading, right? Yep. That's a lame way to end, but there we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> <it's> okay. <laughs> think what he meant to say, if you enjoyed this half as much as we did, then we enjoyed it twice as much as you. If you can do the math. That is right. So thank you very much, both of you. We will now move along to the signing portion, so we'll ask you to remain in place for one moment while we transport the across the story. Uh, we have copies of all of his books at the table. We also have copies of his latest behind our cash desk. So feel free to get a book signed before you pay for it. Just please do pay for the book. Uh, we are very grateful to Doug for coming on board to, to host this event once again. It's always wonderful to see these two chat. Uh, thank you to all of you for your attention, for your questions, to all those watching on YouTube for your attention as well. Of course, to ECW, without whom we would not have a uh, reason to gather here tonight. So thank you for publishing this wonderful book. And uh, please join me one final time in thanking Philip Schoen. Thank you very much.